Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for weekly updates about my podcasts, events, and more. Also, follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And finally, join my virtual book club called Zibby's Virtual Book Club, which meets every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time until 3 p.m. and features half an hour of book club discussion followed by 30 minutes of Q&A with the author whose book we've just discussed. You can sign up on my website, zibbyowens.com, under the virtual book club section, or even on Instagram under the link in my bio. I hope you'll find me in all these different channels and enjoy this podcast. The sponsor for this whole Labor Day Book Blast week is firstbook.org. Obviously, the pandemic is crippling education for millions of students, especially those in low-income communities. The widening digital divide and extended quote-unquote summer slide due to COVID is devastating. Apparently, 40% lack access to reliable internet and functioning digital devices they can use for online learning, making the need for physical books and resources to prevent further educational backsliding absolutely critical. Firstbook breaks down the barriers to education for children living in low-income communities by providing its network of more than 475,000 educators serving children in need with free and affordable new high-quality books, educational resources, and basic needs items through the award-winning First Book Marketplace nonprofit e-commerce site. They need your support to ensure these children have what they need to learn during this critical time. Visit firstbook.org to help. Elizabeth Ames is the author of debut novel, The Other's Gold a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the Helen Zell Writers Program at the University of Michigan. Elizabeth has lived in Seattle, France, and Rwanda since leaving the Midwest. She currently lives in a Harvard dormitory with her husband, two children, and a few hundred undergraduates, or at least it was that way until this year when everything is going virtual. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you so much for having me. I'm particularly excited because I feel like we've been trying to plan this for like five years or something ridiculous, right? This is one of my longest to do <laughs> podcasts that I've had on the list. I know my book has been on for almost a year, but I'm, I really appreciate your flexibility. I'm happy to be on anytime. Um, and <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, so sure glad was, that. <laughs> I'm sure it was my fault. I'm not trying to say it's not, it no, wasn't it was your way. Like, just- we were back and forth. Then there was, there was, there was so many, you know, Obviously, we all had quarantine time and there was sort of like, maybe that's only going to last a few weeks. Maybe it's going to last indefinitely. We don't know. Let's, so I'm just glad we're, we found a time. <laughs> Me too. And I know we're doing video and audio, but for the podcast listeners only, you're in this gorgeous library at one of the houses at Harvard. Just tell me a little a bit about it and about writing The Other's Gold in that library. It must have been oh, amazing. Uh, yeah. People who aren't familiar with Harvard has, I think, 12. I don't want to get it wrong, but I think it's 12 undergraduate houses outside of the freshman houses. It's all funny to talk about, or not funny, but strange to talk about now thinking about like, how will it be this coming fall? And, but last year or any year before, when I wrote this book, I was living, I moved into this house, Quincy house with my husband and our then six month old. And I guess I'm taking it too far back. The point is, I mean, no, go back, go back. (laughs) Okay. I'm in this beautiful library. Every house has its own library. And this is the Quincy House Cube that I'm just in, ducked in for this short time well, to chat with you. But it's beautiful. But wait, keep going back. I like that. So your husband's a professor, and you He's ended up at Harvard. What does he teach? He's in the Department of Folklore and Mythology, and his PhD is in African and African American Studies and Anthropology. So his class this fall is going to be like the Art of Emergency Storytelling in the Time of after ooh, I'm going to get the title wrong, but it sounds like it sounds like a very timely class storytelling in the time of trauma. I'm not I've got this. I got to look at the wow. thing. But yeah, the Department of Folklore Mythology. I just think it's a it's a cool department. Yeah. Gosh, I want to go back to school. <laughs> I miss taking classes. Like, <laughs> should I learn about this or should I learn about that? Like, you know, education is so wasted on the young because at the time I was like, well, you know, if I drop French, I can go out Thursday nights, you know, so, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like what I have to get up. I know. But yes, when we moved here, I had this vantage from this library where the students work and I could look out over the courtyard, which is so idyllic, you know, it's so ma- manicured and green and students would be walking to class. And so I always say like, I, I love campus novels and I always hoped I'd write one. But then when we moved into a dorm, I thought like, this is the time if I'm ever going to write a campus novel, I have to do it now when I'm sort of like, have this really useful perspective for a writer that I'm not 
I'm an outsider and that I'm not a student at Harvard and I don't I really have much of a formal affiliation with the university, but I live in one of the buildings and work with all these students and it was really like a, a privilege and a joy to live amongst them while they were going through this really intense time of being away from home. And I was going through this really intense time of becoming a parent, you know, living here with a six month old. It was, that was what got me thinking about the book was like, this is so weird to be a new mom amongst all these sophomores. I lived mostly amongst sophomores and seeing them, you know, be dropped off at school by their parents and their parents just being like, looking at me with my baby so longingly, you know, giving me the, like, it goes so fast. And I, I, I believe that from like day one, but I also obviously seeing parents drop their kids off at college is like really a, while you're wearing your baby, you're like, if you weren't already weeping, you will be any minute. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, tell listeners what The Other's Gold is about. The Other's Gold, it follows four friends, Alice, Lainey, g Sun, and Margaret from when they meet at fresh, their freshman year at a fictional college, Quincy Hawthorne College. And since I just mentioned, mentioned Quincy House, the college is named in part after Quincy House, but it is an invented college in New Hampshire. They meet their freshman year and it follows them from that time to kind of like when they start having children or not. So it's like a 13 year time period and it's structured around the worst mistake made by each of the four friends during that really intense and transformative 12 years. I was particularly drawn to Alice and her situation with her brother and the accident and how she talked about it and processed it and wanted to tell her friends, but didn't want to tell her friends and how you sort of go through life with secrets. Like, I feel like that's one of the most powerful things in, in books is sort of like, what do people do with their secrets? And, you know, what causes people to do things? And does it matter if you're young or old? And what makes something forgivable and not and all the rest. So I was just wondering about developing her character in particular, if you could talk a little more about how you decided on her sort of narrative trajectory, if you will. Sure. I think she came, I always feel like when you talk about characters, you start to sound like so nutty because you're like, she came to me, but I do think she came to me maybe like third or even fourth. But I think how does a character come to you? I'm not the part that actually feels like magic to me. Like, of, of the th things about writing that are like hard to sort of, I think there's a lot of things that are, you can try to, you know, invite characters into your mind, but sort of, they just kind of come knocking and then you start thinking about them. And then I, I feel like when you get really into it, then suddenly everything's grist for the mill, you know, you'll hear people talking. And I can remember at one point, actually speaking of Alice, because she becomes a doctor, I was sitting by these two doctors at a coffee shop listening to them talk and they kind of were talking about children and one who hadn't had children and she had wanted to, you know, they were just having this pretty intimate conversation about their careers and their lives. And I was just thinking, Alice, Alice, like, oh, you know, because she, she's a doctor, she struggles with her fertility. And those were just strangers in a coffee shop. But I think when, once they, the characters sort of arrive at your doorstep, then the inspiration for them starts, you start to see them everywhere. You know, they're like really present. <laughs> did you have a college experience, anything like this? Like, did you have three girlfriends that you roomed with? Like, did you base the window seat off of a dorm room there? Like, how how real to life at all, if at all, is is the book or parts of the book? I always say, like, I feel like I could count the actual things that came from my life on one hand. But no, I didn't. Have, I went to a large state school, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is a great school. But I think part of my fascination with small liberal arts schools is probably fueled by the fact that I didn't go to one. The idea of the kind of like the ensuite dorm room and the smaller, sometimes claustrophobic environment. I think my curiosity about that partly fueled the book. And I'm, I've am i been very lucky with the long-term friendships I've had, but I've never been part, no, of a, like a quad like that of a foursome. And so I think that partly in, inspired the book too, was just the the curiosity I have about those kinds of friendships where you're living together, taking classes together, eating together, dating, breaking up, you know, sometimes going on to marry each other or not. It's just such an intense time. Your, your bond is forged so intensely. And then, you know, I would see these groups of students just like completely inextricable. And I, would, so I was sort of curious about that, how that friendship forms and then how it's weathered and tested once you're not in the environment that totally supports it. My sophomore year, I lived in a room very similar to that. We had like a 
common room and I had two little, we had two little rooms with two of us each with bunk beds. It was like so tight. You couldn't even like open the dresser (laughs) drawer without sitting on the bunk bed. And the four of us were like a pat, like we did everything together. I remember my dad got married and I was like, well, I have to invite everybody I'm rooming with. They're like, this is my, you know what I mean? Like, that's like, you know, non-negotiable. But it is so interesting to see, even if you took this little group of us, what's happened over time. And you could take any cluster, really. And I think that's what's so great about books. Like, I mean, my group of friends, it's just some little microcosm, right? It could happen to anybody because life is so random. So it's like any characters you pick, all these horrible things and great things are going to happen. And it's just like a, a mishmash, like a commentary on life. I don't know. That was a ramble. Are you still friends with the three people who were your roommates? So my roommate, so there were two, like I roomed with one girl and then the, there were other two and they had actually, the two in the other little room went to St. Paul's together. So they had been friends before. I'm still close to them. We go on girls trips once every other year at this point. Now I don't know when we'll see each other again. One of them lives in Denver. One of them lives in Hong Kong. And then my roommate died on September 11th. Oh, I'm so sorry. I think I've actually read your essay about that. I'm oh, so sorry. That's okay. No, it's okay. But we were friends after school and we lived together after school and when she was she was 25 when it happened but I have so many of those memories and you know all of us on campus together sort of just totally embedded the way you're saying like we wouldn't have gone like if there was a social or whatever it was us with the guys and I don't know it was just that time but yeah to have to lose someone in the group is also you know when you go back it like changes the way you look at sort of everything that had happened right even when we go to reunions it's all like I'm like looking around like <laughs> it's just not the yeah. same so anyway but the book kind of took me back you know to that intensity because you don't get that with anyone I feel like at this age other than I mean there is an intensity I, that comes with sort of parenting in the trenches together that's similar mm-hmm. right because you're like in it and you're stressed and you don't know what you're doing and there's too much to do in the same way that I felt like it was at school yeah <laughs> so I, I think you do get that with some new new parents, especially first time around, but not in that many other junctures, I feel like. Or maybe if you're working in a really intense environment, which I didn't really have that, like, I don't know, big corporate setting where you might bond with people in your class or something, but I don't know. (laughs) No, I think you're right. I think that's what's interesting to me about that span of life, because you're like, as adults, it is unusual to have that kind of same intensity of the circumstance, you know? But I felt like because I was becoming this new parent alongside these students who were like, kind of forging their own new families, it did highlight for me the similarities around like I, your identity changing. Like when you, when you come to college and you're sort of like figuring out who you are and so much of that I think is forged as a result of who you befriend and which is, can, which can be totally random, but you're sort of like, I want to be like this person. I want to not be like this person. And then that kind of ratchets up through college. And then I, I think the, the moments I tried to choose in the book, like around kind of getting married or not, career choices or other kind of touchstones where you're thinking about your identity. Like, what does it mean if this person marries someone who I really loathe? Or what does it mean if my friend chooses not to have kids or another friend can't have kids? Or all these times you kind of define yourself against even your closest friends. And you're, and like you said, when you're new parents, your identity is, that's a complete upheaval. You know, the first time, especially when you're just, I feel like for most people I know who that first, that change from like, not being a parent to being a parent is huge. So I felt like those moments kind of bookending the leaving your family, starting a family, they felt, even though they felt so different, they have some things in common. Totally. I totally agree. Speaking of family, I'm sorry. You can probably hear my son like screaming in the background. Oh, no, I can't, I can't apologize for that. Like that's the side effect of this Zoom life is that people <laughs> are kind of like have to be aware that children exist in some working people's lives, you know? So you've been up there. Have you been there the whole time at Harvard with your, well, now it's not a baby. Now he's not a baby anymore, but. No, yeah, I've been, well, I moved with my husband and first baby when she was six months old and now she's four and a half. So oh we have gosh. been, I've been, I know I've been in, so yeah, it feels like a college, you know, like the, the students who started when we started, they already graduated, but yeah, it's been like, I guess this will be the start of our fifth year and a very strange year. And we've, I've since had a second child who's only ever lived in, it's in a, in, the, in a Harvard house. And it's a really amazing community. I always say I was like kind of wary about moving into a dorm as an adult with a baby. <laughs> you know, Like I lived in this apartment in a kind of like sleepy, really child-friendly neighborhood of Cambridge, like known for being family friendly. And I didn't have kids. And then I moved 
into Harvard Square, which is like, it's family friendly in its own way, but it's also more like you can go out and do stuff that isn't as easy to do when you have a new baby. But it's so, there are other families, there are dogs, there are, the students are amazing. I feel really, talking about it now, I just feel sad because I think like, we don't know what it's going to look like this year. And even if there are some students in this house, they won't be, you know, we won't be eating in the dining hall. We won't be like having the kind of casual interactions with students that make it feel so kind of warm and community-like and with other tutors and other families and pets. So that's just a big, like so much around education. It's just a big question mark. But I have really, I think this is a really special place to have kids. And I felt so lucky for the people that my kids have met. I bet they have like the best babysitters ever. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) you have access to like every, the the most brilliant, awesome babysitters. I feel like I should just come there to poach some sitters or something. (laughs) They're so busy though. Like, yeah, the ones we've had are so amazing, but they're also, they have a lot going on in the school year. I'm sure that's true. (laughs) (laughs) So when did you write, like, how long did it take to write this book? And did you, did you outline, I mean, I know you were talking about the sort of organic nature in which the characters developed, but how did, did, did you have like a structure of, or did you start with that timeline of where the bookends that you just mentioned where that, was that like a do not change type of thing from the outset or? How did you start uh, it? No, I started actually, it was again, kind of college, like, cause it was like a kind of four year start to finish. Like I was just thinking about this because I started like taking notes, like emailing myself notes app kind of notes when my first child was born. And I just wanted to like jot down some of the feelings. It wasn't even like fictional yet. It was just like, I got to figure out how to write about some of this really just intense feelings. I want to write it down now while it's so fresh. And then we moved here and, and I started really getting to work on it when, once we started having some childcare. So when my first child was like eight months old, we had a very part-time nanny share and I did some of those like tentative first steps on this book. And then when she was like a year and a half, I think she was 19 months, she started at this little preschool daycare. And then I really got cooking. I was like, wrote, I had been working on the book, but not in such a consistent way, like in a very piecemeal way, but always walking around thinking about it and, but not just actually banging it out. And then when she started at this daycare, I really figured out how to prioritize my time and be more efficient. And I would drop her off and oftentimes go to this coffee shop that was really nearby that has no internet. And I would just get to work. And so that took me, it was maybe like a year of thinking, a year of writing and then selling the book and then doing some revisions that year. And then it came out. So it was kind of fast. I I had written a book before this that isn't published that took a really long time. It was a lot more labored and protracted. And this book came much more quickly. I felt a lot of joy, not necessarily with the content, but with the, what is it called? The flow. Like when you really get into a project and you're just feeling like the flow. So I think that helped make it happen faster. And the fact that I was just so conscious of my time, I, I always say I closed my tabs sooner because I always have so many tabs open on my browser. And once I was working on this book and knew how precious my time was away from my young baby. I was just like, close these tabs, open word, get to work. Love it. That's good. (laughs) So such a meandering answer. Sorry. No, that was great. I love that. That's true because it's like, I feel like sometimes the less time I have, the more I get done in that time, right? Because I I have to maximize like every second of an hour. But if I have like four hours, then I might like, I don't know. Well, I must have tons of time. I'll go read the paper and I'll, (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I heard an interview with Helen Phillips at the Boston Book Festival. And she talked about that same thing, how she's had like increasingly or like decreasing time with each book, but she feels like she's become a better writer and like makes better use of this time. And her writings become like more concentrated and powerful. I'm probably misquoting her, but I felt like so, I feel so encouraged when I hear people talk about it in that way. Cause I think like, well, you wrote this book, The Need, when you were, when you had this little time and you were doing it in these chunks and it's so incredible. So I love to hear when people and I, I was sort of like totally deluded. I felt like, uh, you know, when I was in graduate school at like 24, I thought you have to publish a book before you have a baby or you never will. Like, obviously there's m- evidence throughout time that that's not true. But I just had this like notion that if you didn't publish a book before you had a baby, it was like all over for you. you just, it's so archaic. I don't know how I got this idea, but it really kind of stuck with me. And then, and for me, it was the opposite. You know, I, I got so much more productive and my career as a writer didn't really take off until after I had a baby. So I think it's helpful for people to hear, especially moms don't have time to read books, like that it isn't always the derailment that you might fear. I can't speak to this during times of no childcare, but certainly when childcare is involved, people with small children can still 
do a lot. Well, it's a whole new set of life experiences <laughs> to draw on and include. And I mean, the perspective of living through it versus just knowing about it informs the writing in such a richer way, I think. So yeah, I mean, if you can find the time <laughs> when, you're, <laughs> when you're a mom, for sure, it's not over. Are you working on anything now? Not much. I'm I'm doing, I'm back to like emailing myself and even like it's degraded to like texting myself at this point, like <laughs> to jotting notes and things. And I need to get more organized because I'm like, Texting, emailing, these notes are everywhere. I got to start pulling it all together, but not too much. I think if we have a little bit more childcare in the coming weeks or months, then, or if I just get more, you know, people also get up really early and write or they write in the night. It's possible. Also, I've just been so distracted and all the things that we're all, I think, feeling during this time. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't mean that you had to say that you were doing things. Like, no, I'm working on something, but very scattered. I like to call it like the filling up stage. Like you're filling up and then you're going to like put it out. It's true. It's so important. I mean, how can you make sense of stuff if you haven't processed it? I I don't know. It's all, it all is part of it, I think. So don't feel bad. (laughs) And you're like the... 500th person who said the same thing. So don't worry about it. I know. I listened to the podcast and I'm like, of course, like all of us, I'm distraught and stressed and all these things is a very intense time. And it is encouraging. I was even prior to this time, I felt like hearing from people who talk about like the rhythms of their work as being like some people write every day and are super regimented and some don't. And then there's just like seasons in your life as with all things where you're like super productive or you're more fallow. And I guess you just have to hope that I think that a lot of writers think if they're in a fallow season, it's like, well, this is it. It's it's like new parenting. It's like a similar mindset where whatever trouble you're having, like, especially those early days, like your child is having all these sleep interruptions. You're like, this is my life now. I don't, I guess I never sleep. I just, I don't sleep. And then a couple of years later, or, you know, hopefully for some people a month later, you're like, oh, I've, I've totally forgot about that time. So I think it's similar with writing in the sense that people, I'm comforted when I hear about people whose books I revere having like forgotten how to write a book between books. So like each one invents itself. And maybe the difference is just that they did, they knew they, that, you know, you know, you can do it. You don't necessarily know how, mm-hmm. but you know, you can do it. So hopefully you can do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you've already like sprinkled in all this advice <laughs> and inspiration, but just, do you have any parting advice to aspiring authors? Sure. I think one piece of advice would be like, to prioritize your work in the way that it is like in your heart, if you can prioritize it that way in your day, that can be really meaningful. Like I feel like I always put writing below a lot of obligations for a long time, like my day job. And obviously that's a huge privilege to be able to move writing up the list. But if you can at any point, and for some people that's grad school or a fellowship or just like doing worse at your day job, then, you know, honestly, like just doing a worse job at your day job and better with the thing that your, your passion is really for. I think that's something that was useful to me. Like for me, that meant like starting the day working on my book instead of getting to it after other things. And the other piece of advice that I was thinking, because I feel like, I don't know, it's hard to give advice, not knowing what someone's doing. But for me, I think having a baby I would walk around with her so much to try to get her to take a nap. And I, I, I wasn't listening to my headphones because I was like, I felt like, you know, she's brand new and I need to be like very alert and not distracted. And that was really good. Like that was really useful for me. I love, I listen to podcasts. I love podcasts. It's like weird advice to give on a podcast. But for me, finding some time that's like generative can be walking or even in the shower or swimming. Just sometime when the voice in your head is, the one for your book and not other voices or music or other, other things. I think that can be like an actual practical tip to try, like see what happens if you just only listen to your own thoughts for a walk. If you're stuck, you know? Yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I don't want to hear my own thoughts. <laughs> That's why I like <laughs> no, to listen. I'm kidding. I know. I want to hear these chats, yeah. but... <laughs> Someone, I can't remember who it was, but somebody said that part of their writing process was that on their commute to work every day, no, like no radio allowed. Like that was her time to think about what she would maybe want to write at lunchtime. No, I'm forgetting who that was. This is anyway, my brain is just falling apart. But it's like what you were saying, like she had that protected time 
when, yeah. I mean, she was driving, but you know, whatever part of your brain that that uses is only like a tiny bit compared to, <laughs> you know, imagination. So. But, but isn't it wild that that sounds I'm like, oh, it sounds so, so boring. Like, don't you want to have the radio on? You know, it, my impulse is like, turn it on. But I guess that being bored, being bored is like so crucial for creative work. You have to be bored. Yeah. And we're all, you know, we don't, we are not bored as much or we haven't been maybe with yeah, it's true. these, these days, but yeah. So planned boredom episodes. I think that's our new thing here. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. We have the time for some boredom. <laughs> Making time for boredom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for coming on Mom's Down Time to Read Books and for sharing your experience and for letting me feel like I got to spend a half an hour in, in a library this morning, which is like a huge Oh, I know. What perk. A treat. Same, thank you so much for chatting with me. It was a pleasure. I, I love, even though I just spoke out against, you know, total silence on your walk, I love listening to the podcast. So it was a pleasure to be part of it. Oh, thanks. You too. Okay, have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thanks so much to firstbook.org for sponsoring this Labor Day Book Blast. Please consider giving to firstbook.org to help their network of 475,000 educators serving children in need. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thank you.